afternoon. Good afternoon. It's great to see everyone today. My name is LaCorey Meadows. I'm a member of the CMC Board of Trustees, and I also serve as the director of Franklin County Extension. It is a pleasure to see everyone here today. All right, so today's forum, Hatching Art 360 Degrees, a unique canvas for collaboration, is sponsored by Puffin Foundation West, represented by Java K Kittrick and her friends today. So won't you please help me thank them. We learn more each day about how thriving communities rely on the arts to stimulate and fuel local economies. In any form, collaboration creativity can be combined to be a powerful tool for progress. Today we have an interesting example of how a creative idea by eggs and artists, and we have the egg here. <laughs> he was like, I gotta go get my egg. <laughs> eggs and artists become a community collaboration. Without further ado, please welcome local attorney and citizen curator of Art 360 Degrees, Charles Bluestone. Dean of the School of Design at the Columbus College of Art and Design, Tom Gaddis. <laughs> Producer and editor of WOSU's public media, Broughton High, Jackie Schaefer. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, Professor Emeritus, Arts and Policy Administration at OSU and former director of the Ohio Arts Council, Wayne Lawson. Wayne, the stage is yours. Thank you. Emeritus for life. Pick, pick a job. Just put it, put it on the card. What's Wayne doing? He's emeritus. Um, before we start, and I, <clears throat> I love the title of this. There were so many ways to introduce hatching. You know, we could have cracked up. We, I went through all of this list, and I thought, don't go there. It's not good, because that will give Chuck ammunition to start some other project, and we want to just stay with this. Let me start by reading a um, <clears throat> quote by Aaron Copeland. And you know Aaron Copeland. And it, it's a good way, I think, to jumpstart the conversation. And for all of you to begin listening to certain words that flow through these conversations. Uh, he said some time ago, perhaps the answer to why a man such as myself composes is that art summarizes the most basic feelings about being alive. Just as we look to 18th century works to try to experience that time, our arts mirror the whole atmosphere of the present. By reflecting the time in which one lives, the creative artist gives substance and meaning to life as we live it. Life seems so transitory. It is very attractive to set down some sort of permanent statement about the way we feel, so that when it's all gone, people will be able to go out to our artworks to see what it was like to be alive in our time and our place, the 21st century. Um, an important statement, I think. So as we begin here, listen for partnership, listen for collaboration, <clears throat> listen for creative artists, listen for public value. The arts as public value is so important. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chuck who several years came to me <clears throat> and asked if I could introduce him to Nanette Macy Jones, uh, the director of the Columbus Museum. And I said, why? And he said, oh, look. And I said, what is that? An ostrich egg. And I thought, should I make the introduction, not make the introduction? You know? uh, <clears throat> why are you carrying around ostrich eggs? And with that, Chuck said, go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, they're, they're an incredible device that sparked imagination from 48 artists from across Ohio and today um, a part of the Art 360 Degrees Contemporary Art Hatching Across Ohio exhibition, which is incredibly touring five museums across the Midwest. And uh, it's on view at the Columbus Museum of Art through August 14th, and then it moves on to Maslin, to West Virginia, et cetera. Um, in 2007, I was, I was given a, a bag of ostrich eggs that had been dipped into dye by 
um, the set designers at Whole Foods here in Dublin, Ohio. And I wanted the ostrich eggs because I had seen 25 years ago in an apartment in New York City where I was living um, a bowl of just ostrich egg shells that looked like this um, in, in a bowl in front of a sofa. And I thought how beautiful, how simple, how pure the line was of the ostrich eggs. And so when I got the bag of dyed ostrich eggs from Whole Foods, I took them home and I put them in the sink and I used borax and Clorox and Ajax and scrubbed and scrubbed, but I couldn't get the dye off. And so I didn't achieve the goal of having just a pure, simple ostrich egg. I wound up with everything looking khaki. Um, and I put them in the basement for about a year and I thought and thought, and I drew on inspiration um, of thinking back to um, afternoons when I, I spent at the Forbes Museum on Fifth Avenue in New York where I would store Malcolm Forbes' collection of Imperial Fabergé Easter eggs. And then one day Martha Stewart had run a, an issue where she featured Pazanki, which is the Ukrainian, Polish, Russian tradition of using beeswax to decorate eggs at Easter time. And then Rivet Gallery had a display of um, objects that they had sent around to artists around the country, and when they came back, you saw various artists using the same object, and you forgot that it was a white plastic dog, and you, you saw them as paintings. And then I also thought about Monet, and how Monet painted the grain stack over and over again, and I thought, wouldn't it be incredible if I turned Monet on his head, and instead of having one artist painting 25 or 48, haystacks have 48 artists paint an ostrich egg. And it would be a challenge to them because most artists, most visual artists, uh, paint or create two-dimensionally. And here they have to work 360 and come around the egg. And so that's, that was the genesis for the title for the show, Art 360 Degrees, which refers to the egg. But it also refers to looking around all parts of Ohio for the best of contemporary artists. And the show today features painters who work in oil, acrylic, watercolor, in caustic, which goes back to the Egyptians as an art form, sculpture, fiber, um, light. Uh, and incredibly, we even have one that's designed on a, three, a computer using 3D printing. So we have 3,000 years of art media. And as I, um, you know, I started back in 2007 with Hani Hara, a local artist, and I said to him, could you paint this thing? And we didn't know if the paint would adhere to the shell or would it slide off. But he worked on it for about eight months and he delivered um, in early 2008 uh, an incredible three portrait um, uh, egg artwork. And then I went to Sarah Fairchild, who's known many of you from the Hammond Harkin Gallery, uh, to Chris Rankin, who paints with encaustic, uh, with Paul Emery from Zanesville. And when I had about five or six of these eggs, I happened one day to run into Ken Emmerich, who for 30 years has worked at the Ohio Arts Council. And I start to describe what I'm doing. And Ken is Ukrainian background. And he got it. And he understood the Pazanki tradition. And he encouraged me to go to other artists around the state. And then every time I met somebody who was an art professional, whether it was Nanette Macy June, and, and I'll never forget her words when Wynne and I met in her office, and she said, what is that? I want that for the Columbus Museum of Art. Um, or Charlotte oh, Gort. And that, yeah, yeah. That does. Or, or the Southern Ohio Museum, or, or Alex Kuhn from the Maslin Museum, et cetera. When art professionals see the quality and imagination in these 48 art, artworks, they're blown away. And what I'm particularly proud of is how approachable they are. I'm not an artist, I'm an attorney. My firm's practice is reducing real estate taxes on our clients' properties. I can't draw, I can't paint. But I came up with this idea and somehow I convinced not only the artists, but a whole cadre of talented people in the business community here in Columbus and around the state, people like Jackie, um, who made the most incredible 30-minute television program on her Broad and High program, or Terry Rawback, um, who does the Pelotonia campaign, um, who helped the CCAD students that David Bennett um, got for us to design the website, to design the poster, to design the um, exhibition catalog, which is coming. Uh, from Key Blueprint, who printed the posters, and, and Grange Insurance, who printed 
postcards for us to announce the openings at the different museums. Um, and I probably can go on to a whole host you of could, other, you other could, collaborators. But, but you're not going to. But know, what's, real, what's really yeah, phenomenal. Well, because you're so quiet and retired. I am. And I know that had nothing to do <laughs> with the project moving forward. But why don't we jump to Jackie now that you mentioned it? Why'd you do what you did to promote this? Um, if anybody's familiar with Broad and High, um, we're a show that focuses on the arts and culture scene here in Central Ohio. And I was um, familiar with, I, I think I emailed Charles a year or so ago and asked him for a list of the artists who are participating. And, and I found it a unique canvas, a unique idea that I thought viewers would be interested. So we followed two local artists as they created their eggs, uh, Janice Mars Wonderlick, who works in sculpture, and um, Cody yeah. Heichel, who works in watercolor. And, um, and I saw interest in, um, for our partners across the state. It's a little different way of collaboration. We share segments and um, viewership in a way, some of my segments with um, PBS stations across the state and across the nation. So there is a huge opportunity that our programming won't be seen just here in central Ohio, but across the nation in markets like Miami and Los Angeles and New York and, and Baltimore and uh, some really great, really great cities. Supporting Columbus's creative artists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was the response? out there to this? Oh, people love it. Dayton's excited to air it. Well, well, one of the responses everybody produces are segments a lot farther in advance than I do. So uh, a lot of these segments haven't been seen yet because they do their programming months in advance. Right. But uh, it's coming, and Dayton is hoping to air it on their uh, local programming in Cincinnati. So um, so yeah, I think I, I don't. Does everybody know that, that these are loaded to a national database, the shows, and the exposure that the city of Columbus gets Creative Columbus, the artists here get, is, is really fantastic. Uh, and I don't think a lot of people know that, that the show is not just located here. It's out there. So they deserve a great round of applause and thanks. <laughs> what, San Diego, Baltimore, Minneapolis, and other, other major? Uh, yeah, there's right? about, I think, 35 stations. 35 stations. Mm -hmm. So why'd you get involved? Well, I think we're always trying to find those opportunities to give our students real world experiences, right? Working with captains of industry, real deadlines to meet, um, you know, real problems to solve. And, and Dave Bennett and his students uh, tackled the website and I think the catalog and a few other things uh, in collaboration with Chuck. Um, you know, those are exactly the kind of moments that we want our students to have. The best way to educate young artists and designers is to emulate real world. And you know, we're giving them those experiences through these kinds of projects. Does that hook into your CCAD um, uh, mind market? Absolutely. Be because entrepreneurship, am I right? Correct. So talk, talk a little bit about you know, that. The mind market really was uh, the vision of uh, Denny Griffith, our, our beloved uh, president. Um, about it, it was really formulated around the idea that the, the, the starving artist is is a really bad idea. So how can we provide them with the resources, the skills, the knowledge base that they need um, to make them successful in the marketplace? So the My Market becomes our hub to connect captains of industry with our students, to give our students those opportunities to work on real projects with real deadlines and real problems to solve. So what was the draw to Chuck's project? Was it Chuck's personality? I th I His think sparkling behavior? I, I'm looking to my, my colleague here, Dave Bennett. I'm going to guess that it was Chuck's magnanimous charm that sucked <laughs> Dave into this process. So. <laughs> that, was, that was it. No, ser seriously, I mean, why, why? I mean, I'm sure a lot of projects pass your desk. A lot of them you could jump on. Here comes a private citizen with ostrich eggs. I think, it was, I think Chuck was compelling, and um, you know. I, I think what happened is I, I told Kevin Conlon, who's the provost and acting president of CCAD, about the project, and I met, and he introduced me to David. And as I'm describing it, my words were strong, but when I opened up the box and laid out on David's desk the seven or eight eggs, his, his mouth was agape with a, with amazement about how incredibly beautiful they were, and it was the eggs and it's the artwork that sells the show. So bring it back to community. You're talking about collaboration. You're talking a little bit about PR, marketing, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, and along comes private citizen to do that. What's the benefit to Columbus? Why should we sit up 
and take notice and say, this is good stuff for the community. Why? So I, I, th I think the idea that uh, art is about culture and culture is about a city and, and a city that has a vibrant arts culture attracts others, right? It brings in businesses, it brings in visitors, it brings in relatives, it, you know, it, it helps to um, you know, create an environment that people want to be in and, and we have a saying at CCAD where CCAD is successful then Columbus will be successful and where's Col where Columbus is successful then CCAD will be successful. And then these kinds of, these are the kinds of things that intrigue people to come and be a part of our community. Jackie? Um, I would think, at least in regards to the eggs, that it's a very approachable subject matter that a lot of people can understand. I might not feel smart enough to walk through the Picasso exhibit or understand. Yes, you are. I know, I know, but I might not. <laughs> it's opening June 9th. But I feel like, you know, from, and I know Charles says this, that children react to, to this medium, and I find it compelling. People look at it, and we all think, like, maybe I could do something like that. And it's a... It's an object that we're all familiar with, and I think we're fascinated to see all of this talent in central Ohio, or well, across Ohio, that um, it does fabulous things, and I, I think it causes me personally to reflect what, what would I do with that egg if I, if I had any artistic talent. <laughs> well, no, I, I remember seeing those seven or eight, and my response was, you have to be kidding. I, they're beautiful, but I couldn't put it together. I think you spoke more eloquently to it, the simplicity of it, and the fact that more people probably understood it than I did. And also, for me, it was because a private citizen took up the cause of supporting artists. Um, and I think that's what sparked my attention. <clears throat> Here comes this guy who's an attorney, and you think, attorney doing this on his own, trying to gather up, going from meeting to meeting to meeting, uh, and I can, I can honestly say, rejected sometimes. I, I saw the rejection. Uh, and continuing to do it. And then Nancy Gilson's story yesterday and the responses from some of the artists she interviewed was very moving. Uh, they were very involved in this process. And it was happening in Columbus, Ohio. And I think too often we forget that when we talk about art, we leave out the individual artist and we talk about the institution. And in every institution, that's, they're about the individual artist. But it's so easy to uh, put individual artists aside because uh, they, they present controversy. Uh, oh my God, they're on the edge. Um, there are states that cannot provide by law grants to individual artists. It's against the law to give money to individual artists through a grant. Who knows how they're gonna waste it? Um, it's true, and here comes Chuck tootling along with that box of ostrich eggs, <laughs> spending all that time to put this project before all of us. And I think that's part of the draw when you start to talk about collaboration. And Chuck, you, you tell a little bit about how difficult it was. We're hearing the success story now. Well, uh, I can remember a Saturday where I spent nine hours on the road driving to Archbold, Ohio which um, is, if you've never been there, um, it's far, far away. Uh, and the road never seemed to end. And Archibald always seemed to be another half an hour, 45 minutes further down the road. And I met with a magnificent artist um, who makes glass marbles. Um, and they are incredible. Um, not the kind that you shoot on the street, but the kinds that people pay $8,000 for a marble. And I went to him and uh, explained the project and explained what I was trying to do to promote the arts in Ohio. And uh, I then told him that there is an honorarium that I paid to every one of the artists, 200 bucks. And when he heard that, um, you know, I, I knew that that was the end of the conversation because he was looking for you know, 20 or $30,000 for these marbles and that wasn't in the budget. Um, every one of the artists was treated by me equally, the same, whether they were the 20-year-old CCAD student, Kyle Bogenreit, um, or the 75-year-old Will Reeder, um, who did this incredible artist, a uh, self-portrait of an artist in coming out of his shell that you can see at the museum, um, including 
um, I had a unique experience where Henry Adams from the Cleveland Museum, who's, Henry was the chief American art curator, introduced me to Ordra Squatis, who's a Lithuanian born but a, a now American artist living in Oberlin. And she typically paints conceptual paintings in yellow and blue. And when I visited her in Oberlin, um, she ultimately made a collage egg uh, using a musical score that is called out for its magnificent artistry by everybody. She introduced me to her husband, John Pearson, who, who I wasn't expecting to meet that day. And it turned out that John was roommates in London in the 1960s with David Hockney. And John had 150 museum exhibitions around the world, and his paintings sell in the six figures. And uh, he made one, and when I told him he got 200 bucks, he kind of laughed. <laughs> um, but it, it, I think the point is that anybody, and when I talk to children, and children in particular love the show, when I talk to children, I say, you don't need to be a multimillionaire to appreciate art, to develop a love for art, to do a project like this. You, anybody can do this project. Anybody can make an object, an art object, out of this egg. And uh, the 48 people who did have done a fantastic job. So how, how do you talk to the average citizen in becoming more involved, not necessarily taking it in the direction you did, but what, what would your advice be to the person who says, why, why, why art? I would suggest, why, why should I do that? Yeah, I would suggest going to the website that David Bennett and his CCAD students have created because on the website, which is magnificent, every one of the 48 artists has their own individual page. You read their history, you read their artist statement about creating this artwork and what they're trying to cr do more globally through the, the, the bigger body of work that they make. Um, every day, the artwork that's in my office, I think everyone's, you've been to my office, I think Jackie's been to my office, no? Um, but David we're has, and invited. you're all invited. <laughs> you know, we, we, we didn't want to have the typical golf course kind of etchings uh, that a lot of law firms have. We have true original artwork, you know, ranging from something I bought for 20 bucks to a couple thousand bucks, and it brings joy to my life every day. Um, I took a class at the, in the closing chapter at Rutgers College in the, in the spring semester. American art history, 1900 to the modern day, and that one class has engendered a love for the visual arts unparalleled. And so when I travel around the country or go to Europe, um, I, I do by myself little art trips where I go to Washington, Chicago, or San Francisco, visit museums, visit galleries, and sometimes bring back uh, a little memento to uh, remind me of the trip. Are they but eggs? No, no eggs, but real paintings, <laughs> paintings, paintings, and prints. Okay. And prints. You don't know. He could, it, he could be collecting eggs in Switzerland or in the mountains. Talk a little bit, uh, Jackie, uh, about collaborations. And Tom, because, because Chuck's been talking about collaborations. Right, right. And um, I'd love to hear some more about that. Well, I see it a lot more in the Columbus community, and I'm, it excites me. Uh, WSU was part of the Twisted um, uh, event last year, seeing the ballet and opera and the or the orchestra collaborate, and WSU had a nice role in that. We're looking forward again this year. But I mean, I, that kind of stuff excites me when we can all band together, whether individual artists, which excited me about this project too, that all these artists kind of came together in that one unified um, project. And to see that also among organizations, I just think it makes us a stronger community as a whole. And I'm happy to, I'm happy to shine a spotlight on it wherever we can. Which you do, which is great. Tom? So from an educational perspective, we know that each of our students upon graduation is going to be required to collaborate. You rarely get to work in a vacuum by yourself. So we're trying to provide those opportunities that teach them those collaboration skills. So we're doing some, some really incredible stuff. We just finished a project uh, thanks to support from Java and the Puffin Foundation uh, around human trafficking where we brought students from all kinds of disciplines together to try to help solve that problem for the Columbus community. Um, uh, this coming year we're working with Abbott Foods and Higher Electronics. Uh, we did projects with General Motors and Airstream and we're doing things like the Give Back Hack and um, uh, Startup Weekends and those kinds of opportunities that bring students together with professionals, with their faculty uh, to learn how to do this in a, in a professional setting. I'm just curious, do you think a lot of the collaborations take away some freedom from the artist 
to have time to just create? Or do you think collaborations are saying to them, if you don't collaborate, <clears throat> we can't get you grants and we really can't support you? Um, I'm, I'm just curious. I've, I've heard both sides as the chair of the Alliance of Artists Communities. And some artists have said, don't force me into a collaboration. Uh, I want to be supported for six weeks. Leave me alone, and I'll create. And I'll, when I'm ready, I'll come back to you. And they get funding. Or you have the ones who say, I want to be part of the community. I want to share, and I want to be part of the collaboration. Could you speak to that just briefly? Or if you don't want to speak to that briefly, <laughs> I could. I, I could did, speak I, to that. I did a segment um, in the last couple of weeks on Pinch Flat, which is the bike poster uh, at Wild Goose Creative. A lot of graphic designers, about 30 graphic designers, come together to make um, uh, screen printed posters uh, or traditionally printed posters in a limited run. And it's to benefit Wild Goose Creative. And I was talking with the, one of the organizers, who himself is a graphic designer, and most of these guys and, and, and ladies and uh, many CCAD students and graduates um, who work in the private um, realm. Um, so the, the organizer, who himself is a, is a commercial graphic designer, was explaining to me how um, this project itself, a lot of graphic designers are told to create under guidance of a brand and certain colors and certain designs. And here they created this event. Um, but now, sorry, I'm catch my thoughts. If a graphic designer goes home and just wants to create something for himself, might need the genesis of an idea to launch and further. So they just said bikes. Bikes in Columbus. And that gave a little bit of a launch pad for some of these artists and designers to kind of have something to go on but use their skills um, to create something that was uniquely their own. But um, I don't know. I thought that was really an interesting sort of concept yeah. of how they came together. No, I asked, I asked the question because in, in some ways it reflects the way communities view artists and the changing nature of the artist <clears throat> responding to community. Uh, and I'm not putting a negative on it. I'm just saying it's another way of looking at the artist uh, as a participant and not somebody who's separate from the community, uh, but part of the community. And I think that's very important, and I think that's part of what Chuck's project was about. In um, about five minutes, we're going to start the Q&A. So start thinking about questions that you have. And I know you'll have questions. And wh where's the mic going to be? And the mic, oh, the mic is right there. So brush off your coat or your blouse crumbs and go on over there, and I'll be back in just five minutes. So what's public art? And any of you can jump in on that. Because we hear the term a lot. Um, we see it around us, all, all around us, right? There's lots of it here in Columbus. In fact, Columbus is quite the playground. Uh, for public art. Uh, one of my very good friends, Andrew Scott, uh, did the gavel that sits in front of the State House. Um, I call Columbus his sort of personal portfolio. Uh, lots of stuff over in the King Lincoln District and uh, really a wonderful sculptor. Um, but, you know, is it about that idea of evoking some response from the public or is it merely for enjoyment? Jackie? I love the gavel. It's the, my second favorite piece of public <laughs> art in Columbus. The first is the uh, deer along the riverfront by a... Uh, um, Why is it important? If, if you think it's important. I mean, I do think it's important. I, I don't think Columbus has enough public art in the traditional realm of definition of that word. I don't... I, don't, I wouldn't call it... I, I wouldn't think it's a playground. I, I think we could do better. Okay, I don't Chuck? know how to do that, though. Well... Public art to me ranges from Tuberry Garden with its beautiful recreation of Seurat's painting Sunday afternoon on the Island of Grand Jard, uh, to the, the murals uh, that change every three or four months up in the short north. And it, it adds to the environment. Um, I think that GCAC's slogan, Columbus Makes Art, Art Makes Columbus, is dead on point. Why do you think there's not much support for public art. I mean, most people in this room are linked in some way, probably, <clears throat> with art or the art world, and would pass public art 
stop, discuss it in some way. But is this the majority to whom public art speaks? Well, obviously, we've just come out of the recession, so that puts constraints on, on the government's ability to fund projects like that. Uh, you know, were I on city council here in Columbus, I would mandate that every, all of the new development that's occurring downtown, that some portion, whether it's 1% for the, uh, should go to public art to enhance the environment in which we all live. Okay. Tom? I think communities have to make it a priority. Um, and, you know, whether that starts with the government or whether that starts with private funding, um, you know, somebody has to step up and take the lead and, and make it a priority. And Chuck's idea there that new construction should have a percentage is a great way to get that going. Do you all remember Malcolm Cochran's Field of Corn? Uh, I was there when it was put up, very young. Um, that was so controversial. And I remember Malcolm and Denny Griffith at panels being attacked. Uh, what a waste of time. Uh, how embarrassing for the city. Um, and it was like, this is a public piece. And now people take visitors there to see those corn cobs. Uh, it's been restored, and it's, it's a piece of our community. When Maya Lin did um, the Vietnam Memorial, and I, I happened to be close friends with Maya's uh, father and worked with him, and he said, you know, they're going to kill her because of that. She did that. She ruined reputation. Where are we now on the, um, the Vietnam Memorial? Uh, so every, every single one of those pieces uh, are exposed to the public, and they cause a reaction. Um, that reaction, I think, has changed over time. But how do we in this community, because we are an arts community, um, continue to support and push public art number one, but is everybody in the room able to say to a person who says to you, art is, 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 is over there, that, you know, let, let them do what they want to do. Why is important? Is everyone in the room capable of saying there is value, public value, to art in the community? But it, I, I think everybody has to ask that question because when you meet other people who are non-arts people, um, <clears throat> then it becomes a responsibility of the arts person to say, let me just, let me give you the elevator speech, uh, which I think a lot of people can't give when we start to talk about the arts. And I think that's very important. Wayne, if I could just respond, how do we foster the arts? We start with teaching art in public schools. Um, it, okay. Um, Joy Gonorowski, who's the vice president of, of the Columbus Museum of Art, tells me all the time, it's not STEM, but STEAM. You add in the A for the arts. Right. Uh, I, I, for, uh, our law firm, for the last 15 years, um, has been sending out holiday cards. We now send out about 600 holiday cards made by school children um, in maybe eight or nine different districts. And every holiday card is different. It's an original artwork. And, what's, and it carries on the back a message that the three R's are important, but so too are dance and band and theater uh, and poetry and, and urging people to support arts in the schools. And it's amazing to me, uh, it really is amazing, that in August, people will come up to me, Wayne, and say, thank you for the Christmas card. Thank you, you know, or I collect them year after year because they value that spirit of imagination that the children evince. And we have to encourage that in the schools, support arts programs in the schools, because that's where the future artists are going to come from. Great. Can I, can I, Oops. Yeah, go ahead. So um, the National Endowment for the Arts tells us that only 26% of high school students have access to a formal arts education. That number has dropped dramatically over the past 20 years. We see those students coming to our art and design school without any formal training in their background. The, the new economy is a creative economy. The new economy is about services and about creative thinking and about new forms of engagement with customers that isn't the same as it used to be. We need artists and designers desperately. And we need to start that training and that practice much, much younger. And just a few years ago at this very forum, um, Jane Scott invited Richard Florida, who I think is a professor from Pittsburgh University, uh, who came and talked about the importance of the creative class 
um, in the economic and social health of, of American cities, and he was spot on. Do any of you uh, know the name Lee Fisher? Formerly involved in government and now the head of uh, CEOs. Uh, he spoke at the Barnett Symposium on campus not too long ago. And he was showing slides of various cities. And this city came from here to there, here to there. And the final slide uh, had a huge calder uh, hanging there and the riverfront. And it was going on. And, it, and they give a $50,000 prize. What city is that? And everybody went, it's Grand Rapids, Michigan, um, that came from back there when nobody visited it and wanted to wipe it off the map to one of the premier cities, creative cities, uh, based on what they did with the arts. Let's go to Q&A and just state your name and ask the question, and we'll answer. I'm Carol Looper, and I have two practical questions, I guess basically for Chuck. First of all, will this continue, or is it finite? Are you going to mount another group of eggs with another group of artists? And secondly, are they going to be available for purchase so people might have them in their homes? Um, Carol, I love these eggs so much. So in, in, in the spirit of, of Pharaoh from ancient Egypt, I'm going to be buried with all, all of them when I, when I go. <laughs> um, I am very pleased to tell you that um, this week there is a sixth museum who's coming to Columbus to look at the R360 exhibition and is considering taking the show to another venue. Um, but mo most significantly and amazingly, uh, the Columbus Cultural Arts Center invited me to curate a show in April of 2017, uh, which will be paintings by the R360 artists. So each of the artists will have an opportunity to provide two or three paintings or prints or sculptures, uh, and then we'll be able to compare them to the non-traditional art form that they use for this exhibition. So that's coming next year. Very nice, very nice. Um, my name is Ben Shinneberry. I am with the Arts and College Preparatory Academy. Um, so we have 34 different arts classes at our school. Um, most students go on to major in arts, um, and there's just a huge love for arts at the school. And we, it really is a part of our culture, and we value it. So my question is, from our perspective, what can we do um, for the city? Which one of you wants to jump? I think exposure. You know, give, them, give those students the opportunity to see as much as you can possibly get your hands on. Uh, bring in artists and designers to come and talk to them about career opportunities. Uh, that it's more than just you know what they probably think in their head, but there's really tremendous opportunities for creative talent uh, that span a whole gamut of, of, um, of professions. Jackie? Um, and from my perspective in the media, I would encourage anyone in the room, including your students, to reach out and promote your own, your own talent and yourselves and to tell us about your interesting stories. Um, whenever I hear a good story, I'm inclined to share it. So um, feel free to come up and get a business card afterwards. Chuck, you want to add her? No. No? So I just have a comment or two. Um, my name's Stacy Lehman. I'm a local artist, and I moved here 15 years ago. And a New York dealer said to me, oh, Columbus, Ohio, that's a great place to be an artist. And I thought she was crazy. Yeah. And 15 years after living here, I can't herald this community enough. I think we are really at a renaissance of our artistic growth and support for artists. And our dealers and our galleries collaborate. They work well together. GCAC really helps artists be artists. Um, it's just a great place to be an artist. And thank all of you for your work, CCAD. I mean, it's just, it's wonderful, and I'm grateful. That's nice to hear. Who are you, madam? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Ro Rosa Stoltz. Um, a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I have to be cheeky, because um, that's my middle name. Uh, this is uh, a, a, an egg, yes? The ultimate collaboration from a marketing point of view would be where did this egg come from? Um, and how did it, an ostrich egg uh, start a project? I mean, if we took these eggs to the zoo and asked the ostrich eye, 
uh, which they thought was the most magnificent egg, what would the answer be? I know it sounds a little cheeky, but um, how do they stay whole? I'm at, now I'm being at the five, uh, five-year-old level. How, uh, so my question is, does the object, before it becomes a work of art, have a life that's connected to art in a different space? Okay, so that's number one. Number two, darn it, I wish you could have brought uh, a screen so that we could have seen up close some of these pieces. This is about the visual um, part of the project as well as other things. Rosa, when you're going to leave here, I'll drive you to the museum. I'm going to walk with you. And then you'll I'm take me to the zoo. With you then you'll and take go me to the zoo. OK, thank you. I, I will call right now. Thank you. Well, OK. But yeah. seriously, you well, want to answer well, that? Well, the original eggs, the original eggs came from Whole Foods. And then I bought a couple on eBay. And then I met a, a wonderful woman named Kathy Hamilton in Texas. So I, I, I met her online and described to her the project, and she saw the website uh, that the CCAD students created, and she kindly offered to give me the jumbo ostrich eggs at her, at her wholesale price. So that's where they literally come from. The one that you're holding is by R. Dean Nelson, who's a professor of photography in the arts department at Ohio State University, and that is a photogram uh, using the Van Dyke process where she took f the egg and applied a photosensitive substance to the outside of the shell, and then she brought it to her front lawn and laid flowers on it, and every three or four hours turned the egg, and it was the sun that created the photogram. Um, there are a couple of examples of ostrich egg artworks in the back of the room. Those were practice eggs that some of the artists uh, did. Uh, the main body of the, the body of 48 eggs is at the museum, which I think is 480 East Main Street here in Columbus. Broad, broad, broad. broad, broad. Thank you, Broad Street. You, Rosa, I think what would be great as a follow-up now is some kind of great performance piece. And Jackie announces, "Ladies and gentlemen of Broad and High, I'm watching an ostrich come down the street." And <laughs> you call in. Same thing in Victorian Village, yeah. and we we can do an entire piece around it. Nice question. Go ahead. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Franklin Conaway, and um, I think I appreciate almost all of the arts, um, maybe all of them, but I have a feeling that in Columbus there's one form of art that even among artists as well as the general public does not seem to get as much attention and recognition as it does in other cities, and that form of art is architecture. Um, I uh, have noticed in working in other cities around the, cities around the country and, and in Europe that the arts community seems to more strongly view architecture as an art form and an art form that should be honored, respected, and understood. And architecture is everywhere as an art form. Uh, so that's uh, my statement, and I just have a question as to whether you feel, whether we're talking about historic architecture, very fine quality contemporary architecture, we can and should do more within the arts community to appreciate architecture as an art form, as, as well as helping the general public do that. Yeah, well, my, my solution is I used to run study abroad program at Ohio State when I was chairman of Compilette. I would take students to Europe for six weeks. <clears throat> Before we left, each student had to adopt a building in every single city we visited. They came to learn about the building, who lived in the building, the history of the building, and it was very funny because we'd arrive, student would say, come here, come here, come here. This is my building? And we'd all have to hug the building. We'd have to put our cheek up against the building and listen to the student tell us what that building meant. If every school kid had a teacher who took them out to buildings and just said, do you know what's inside there? Do you know why did, they, why did they build that building? And let the kids come and learn about the building. It's real simple. Uh, you, you know, it doesn't take an advanced degree to do that, but it certainly could lead to the appreciation of what architecture means, good architecture, to every city, particularly this one. Any other response? 
So uh, I, I've also done quite a bit of travel abroad uh, with my students, and, and one of my fondest memories is uh, at the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, uh, Antonio Gaudi. Um, and it, it's just this wonderful piece of architecture that's, that's been under construction for 200 plus years. And so I had the opportunity before we go, let's you know, have the students learn about this, and so we're prepared when we get there. And we walk in, and one of my students, Julia Kemp, uh, was just brought to tears by the experience. That you know, it was so overwhelming and so stunning and so beautiful. And then when you also realize that most of that was built without the advantage of CNC equipment or computers or 3D printing, um, it's, it's a stunning piece of work. And it is a piece of art. Summarize, let's summarize, and let me just throw out the word partnerships, collaborations across disciplines in Columbus, Ohio, right now. Magnificent. Na name something. Um, Puffin Foundation. Um, I had an opportunity years ago to quickly meet Java Kittrick, uh, who heads up the Puffin Foundation, Puffin Foundation West, uh, which is uh, involved with social action. And through um, the auspices of the Columbus Metropolitan Club and R360, we've gotten to be better friends, and I've gotten to know more about the Puffin Foundation, and it's just a wonderful organization. Great. Jackie? Um, I would say I'm in awe of our spaces, our physical spaces. That kind of maybe goes to architecture a little bit. But we have, not only do we have beautiful museums, but we have some really stunning galleries. Urban art space is one that I think people should be encouraged to go to just to, I don't know, breathe in their, their presence. So, And then I think there's a lot of under-recognized, I don't know if that's the right term, of performing arts and music, which um, maybe doesn't always, it always takes sort of a backseat to the visual arts. So. Um, okay. Tom? Uh, I encourage you to come to the Columbus College of Art and Design. We're, we're, uh, we're doing all kinds of really wonderful things, and if I can put in a couple of plugs, uh, Columbus Film Festival happens every spring, uh, is now uh, a part of the CCAD, and we had our inaugural Chroma exhibition, the best of CCAD, just a few weeks ago. Uh, probably 2,000 people showed up uh, to see that, uh, which was really incredible. We hope to see that grow. Uh, to more than double that number. So. Wayne, can I just point out that on the R360 website, if you look under the shop tab, you'll see that there are some posters for sale uh, which have details of the 48 artworks as well as the forthcoming exhibition catalog. And through with the support today of Jane Scott from the CMC and Nanette Macy-Junes from the Columbus Museum, anybody here in the audience today who makes any contribution from a dollar on up uh, to the Columbus Museum of Art to support the R360 project, we'll get a poster for free. So please uh, see us at the back of the room uh, after the forum. If you have not seen the eggs at the museum, get over there and see them. Also, uh, next Friday, uh, the Pizzuti Collection opens a collaboration with Patricia Dominguez from Santiago, Chile, fabulous artist. Uh, the Columbus Museum will be opening on the 9th the Picasso in collaboration with the Barnes in Philadelphia. Also most incredible. Lots of collaborations in the city. Take time to find them. Go on up to somebody and say, I support individual artists in Columbus, Ohio, because it has value. Thank you. What an awesome conversation. Thanks to each of you. Um, on behalf of the CMC team, as well as the CMC Board of Trustees, I would like to congratulate our own CMC photographer. Where is he? Is he in here? OK, yes. Um, Rick Buchanan. He was chosen um, out of more than 1,000 artists to exhibit at this year's Arts Festival. So congratulations. We're so excited for you. Great job. Can't wait to visit. Your booth. Okay, so I hope that you enjoyed today's forum. We encourage you to continue the conversation with coffee and cookies in the back. Um, you can view and share today's forum and all of our forums on CTV Columbus Television, on WOSU and PBS affiliates statewide, through the Ohio Channel, and anytime on CMC's website via YouTube. Please help me thank our sponsor, Puffin Foundation West. Thank you, Java. And our speakers, Charles Bluestone, Thank you. Tom Gaddis, Jackie Schaefer, 
and our wonderful moderator, Wayne Lawson. And thanks to all of you for being here. We look forward to seeing you at CMC again soon. Have a great afternoon.